we are capable we have evolved to be social creatures who are willing to reach out kindness to strangers is something our species can actually do and it's not a romance it's a reality and that's the power of samaj to me at least i just wanted to put it out because this phrase has caught on samaj sarkar bazaar and i thought i should explain a little more what i mean by that and that yeah. uh, that the conversation needs to deepen in your fa- in your homes in your offices and with your political representatives samaj comes first what can we in the samaj do to make sure the bazaar and sarkar are accountable to this larger samaj interest has the balance moved too much do we need to reset it those are the questions that i am asking Our guest today is a woman of many paths. She's been a journalist. She's now one of the world's best-known philanthropists, and above all, she is known for her work engaging with a series of civic and public policy issues. Everything from the issues of water and sanitation to why the feminist conversation must include how boys and men are molded. I'm talking, of course, about Rohini Nilakani, who's recently published book, fascinatingly looks at the intersection of what she calls. समाज सरकार एंड बाजार इन अदर वर्ड्स रोल ऑफ द सिटीजन एंड द रोल ऑफ द स्टेट एंड द मार्केट्स इट इज माई प्लेज टू इंट्रोड्यूस मिस नलकनी ऑन आर ब्रॉडकास्ट दिस इवनिंग रोहिणी इट्स ऑलवेज ग्रेट टू सी यू एंड थैंक यू फॉर टॉकिंग टू अस आई हैव टू स्टार्ट बाय आस्किंग यू टू टेल अस लिटिल बिट मोर अबाउट अ वेरी मूविंग सोर्ट ऑफ एनिक डोट दैट यू एल्यूड टू इन दिस बुक बट यू डोंट एक्चुअली से too much about you say that your engagement with civic issues actually started with the car accident a terrible accident that took place with very very close friends of yours and that got you involved with issues of road safety and the rest as they say is history can you talk a little bit about how this tragedy actually engaged you when for most people it would have completely broken them you were also a pregnant mother then you were expecting uh, a, you know you were expecting at the time and this was a tragedy that actually took away a friend who and her unborn child if i'm not wrong so talk a little bit about that incident and how it shaped you and molded um thank you bhakar i haven't spoken too much about it because you know tragedies happen in so many lives and in india as you know honestly personal tragedies happen all the time uh, in 1987 actually my very close friend chaitan and rekha were coming traveling at night which is not a great idea but um her a truck just came actually on the wrong side of the road and smashed them to death okay with their unborn child and only their little child his son survived because no seat belt he fell to the floor Somehow it was very traumatic um, um, at the time. It seemed so unnecessary. We've all had people die in road accidents in our extended families. It it bothered me maybe because my hormones were also jumping <laughs> since I was pregnant, and it stayed with me after the babies were born. Also, I said, no, no, this has somebody has to do something about this. And so, talking to a lot of other people in the city, Kiran Mazumdar, Jagdish Rao, so many people came together. Only the Rao, we all came together to set up Nagrik for safer roads. Um, so I had to do something. I couldn't let it go. I had to feel that if something is wrong, I have to participate in changing it. I think in that sense, as a journalist, you know, we always have to report on things. We try to report on things that are wrong so that people get engaged in the conversations to set them right. and i felt i had to start a civil society organization to see what like minded people could do and then from 1992 to 2022 um i have tried to learn and do better since then uh, you know it's such a moving story and i have to ask you what happened to the young boy who survived that accident so he had the most beloved of families to look after him the father sister has been looking after him sharan is doing very well by god's grace and uh, you realize the power of the family everybody rallied around and touch wood uh, he is a beloved sibling of the children of his father's sister very very uh, moving and yet i must ask you you know you're right in that as journalists and you know i don't know how many people know that actually most of your life has been spent being a journalist before uh, you became uh, what you call a social social entrepreneur and you write about how that's a phrase that irritated you till you learn to accept it uh, but 
look at the data on how many people have given up indian citizenship in the last 3 years you know i was looking at it and i think it's about 3.9 lakh people that's what the government informed parliament and when i was juxtaposing that with your book and your optimism about the engaged citizen i was wondering where you get that optimism from because if you look at our times it seems as if more and more people especially those with privilege are seceding as it were from their civic engagement No, I mean the way we grew up, Balka, in our family, there is no question that uh, we we very much are rooted in in this soil. We are very much rooted in the values of this country, and uh, there is no question of abdicating responsibility. Um, my in my house, we were taught about simple living and high thinking. I'm not so not so sure we've kept the simple living part, but we do try to keep the high thinking and. I really feel in my family always the stories were about sacrifice and service before self, and um, those were the ideals held up to us. So even when we came into wealth, I think we tried to see it as a, 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 a as something that you give forward, and um, that you know creates a lot of meaning in one's life. It enriches your life when you participate in trying to. Uh, help build the better society that you only want to live in. So I think it's added a lot of meaning to our lives and made it much richer. And I don't mean materially, of course. So this no question of seceding and abdicating. Uh, yeah, India not you, not you, but so many people. Are, yeah, but so many people are doing it. Not you, but so many people are. Yeah, doing but it. I think people ha- are beginning to realize. See, the younger wealthy, you know, they are quite engaged. They realize that. you cannot separate yourself and your wealth i have written about how the elite have seceded and there are points when you can't secede anymore how will you secede from climate change how will you secede from pandemics you can't and when that realization comes i think the reengagement comes as well and we have to that public pressure on this as well i mean it's not going to happen in isolation which is why the samaj and what's happening in the samaj is so important to me and that's a great point how do you secede from climate change when you've got floods in south korea and new york city and uh, 40 degrees temperature in london uh, as they say you can run but you can't hide uh, there is a kind of globalizing uh, sort of call to action as it were but let me ask you about the very title of your book there's a great story with it that i think our audience should hear about about a trip that you make to bihar and how uh, you know uh, somebody's luggage gets lost you go to a little shopping strip you're driving through sort of next Still hit areas, and uh, one of your colleagues, Premji, talks about uh, how in the good old days, uh, samaj was the, the priority, and sarkar and bazaar came later. Now there is this romance about the good old days, but today, honestly, do you think samaj actually comes first? Do you think we're we're a citizen-led model of governance, or is that just a utopian dream that you have? No, I think what Prem Kumar Verma said to me, and then you know, I read lots and lots of books uh, that are about the whole same theme. Because obviously, the question of the role of society, state, and market has occupied people forever. Uh, what he said really made me think because he said, "Pehle samaj uh, was the strongest base, the foundation for which sarkar and bazaar had to work." Because obviously, samaj came first, and sarkar came to serve the. Samaj, whether it was the monarchs of old or the feudal lords, and now hopefully in in republics and in democracies, it is elected representatives. But and similarly, the bazaar had to come in to 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 set value, to regulate exchange, right, and to build goods and services so all of us could experience more abundance. Uh, so, but Samaj was for sometimes we forget that Balka. I feel. It was in the last century or so, and maybe there have been episodes of that before too. The story of the bazaar and the story of the sarkar has overtaken the narrative. Tons and tons has been written about it, and then the samaj sort of recedes into the background, where I think it needs to be in the foreground. And we, if we flip the switch and understand this, anybody who is in the sarkar and the bazaar, whether you are a CEO or a minister. when you go home you are a citizen and a human being right so just flipping that switch and 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 a mental model sort of correction to say samaj comes first what can we in the samaj do to make sure the bazaar and sarkar are accountable to this larger samaj interest 
Has the balance moved too much? Do we need to reset it? Those are the questions that I am asking. And, uh, you know, one of the things that you remind us, and I saw this firsthand when I traveled across the country during the pandemic, is the power of the citizen during a crisis like this, when actually it was community that came to the fore, whether in terms of feeding migrant workers or just helping people using social media. And I was intrigued by this idea that you have of the digital citizen. Uh, you know, you talk a lot about how this is going to be the future and how old world NGOs need to embrace this in a way that some of them are still too slow to do so. And you have a very interesting example. I think you talk about how uh, the loha that was given uh, to, 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 to build the Statue of Unity, Sadat Patel's statue, was also an example of a mass uh, movement that in the old days would have taken weeks, if not months. And now social media can be used as a sort of weapon of mass mobilization. So speak about what is this digital citizen? And, you know, a lot of people would be cynical and tell you, Rohini, but there's so much toxicity on social media, there are the trolls. Uh, you know, there's also the mob, you know, so where's that line that separates uh, mobs and mobocracies uh, from the power of the citizen online? Yeah, see, it's all happened so fast, the technology of the last few years. So we are still figuring out the public codes, you know, the new norms to set so that it's not just the, the negative side coming out but the positive also. It will take time, but it has to happen. People cannot live at the edge of things all the time, right? It will swing to some normal new codes of behavior, just like we did when the phone came and the printing press came and the television came and everything came, right? So it will happen uh, with digital media uh, too. But um, the reason I say it is because the digital age, at least as far as I know now, seems to be here to stay. I can't see us going back into the only physical world. Then what does that mean? This is the questions that we all have, right? Where it's become so polarizing. How can we make it instead spaces for public reasoning? And how will a digital civil society emerge that in the digital age, the Sarkar and the Bazaar have acquired even more power, right? Power of through algorithms, the market seems to know what we should think. Through various surveillance tools, the Sarkar wants to know what we are doing and has more data on us than we have on ourselves. So in those circumstances, what should we as Samaj do to claw back space? How can we do it with a positive sense of association, create new tools and processes to do so? And to do so, you have to do it digitally. You can't be on the digital Samaj age and do things only offline. So my concern is, what new digital civil society needs to emerge to play the same roles to hold Sarkar, Bazaar and other elements of Samaj accountable to peace, prosperity, harmony, etc. So we have to do it digitally and civil society needs to get very quickly savvy to build out those new forms, roles and responsibilities digitally so that in fact the new better conventions of people's behavior will begin to emerge. People can get together digitally to do positive things. You know the pandemic is not the last emergency. Imagine when I mean, climate change and other things start to happen and create human distress. Digitally, if civil society is ready, today if we build trust digitally between groups, between Sarkar, between Bazaar and civil society and the Samaj, how much more rapidly we will be able to respond. You definitely saw that quite a bit in your travels during the pandemic, right? So much online organization yep. was happening. People's hearts and minds are so quickly engaged. Uh, and, 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 and you know, to, 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 yeah. individual giving went up 43% in those three months. And that's just the tip of the iceberg because that's all the data we have. There must be so in, much more. Individual giving went up 43%. That's fascinating. I was just going to tell you that it was through, uh, let's say, social media that I found places to stay, you know, during the lockdown. I would be like, I'm in so-and-so state. I need a place to stay. And a complete stranger would say, Mere dost ka, dost ka ghar, or, you know, here's where we can get food. And it was actually 
a great sense of community and therefore i've seen the possibilities of this but talk also about what you uh, you've really never been cynical nanka you have seen it too many times we can't be cynical about the human species you know this is only what it is we are capable we have evolved to be social creatures who are willing to reach out kindness to strangers is something our species can actually do and it's not a romance it's a reality and that's the power of samaj to me at least and 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 may there be more people like you and i'll come a little later to whether there are enough uh, uh, you know of 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 us who are giving but i want you to talk a little bit about the paradox of the indian citizen that you capture in your book when you talk about what you learned when your husband nandan nilakani ran for office and you said that you discovered that the indian citizen simultaneously expects too much and too little from lawmakers and there's this kind of expectation of very hyper local issues that a member of parliament may not be empowered to actually fix uh nandan loses the election but you learn a lot while campaigning with him about how the citizen responds to their lawmakers talk about that yeah it was really a fascinating experience balkha and i i did learn a lot and i was really and truly humbled and just the participation of the people okay the elite were a bit uh, uh, aloof but everywhere we went people had questions they're so happy they found not the real candidate yes but even they were happy to have me because they had so much to yeah. say about once a year once in five years they get somebody to really listen to them and they just had a lot to say about the difficulties they experience every day but it is true that therefore they expected the team of candidate to immediately solve all their local problems and i used to ask but how will this person do it because that's not he doesn't have the power by by the constitutional framework to actually come and fix your pipeline or your road right that has to be done differently with your with your panchayat or your civic body um but th- that didn't cut water at all they were telling all that you have come from my boat and this is what we want and you need to listen so that was fine but nowhere did i find any of them being concerned and and this is because the politicians don't talk about it maybe the media also can talk more about it and certainly civil society needs to get engaged that if our lawmakers made much better laws because in the book i do write about we do have issues with the kind of laws that are being framed that sometimes unnecessarily criminalize that sometimes are not very clear and concise if we had better laws that then could be held for all we have equality before the law and the constitution and then you could hold everybody to account through good policy and law that might help those women and men that i met in the campaign more than if nandan or whoever won the election managed to fix their pipe for now so if we thought long term and we deepen those conversation about the role of politicians it would be certainly better for the public and probably better for the politicians as well who i discovered have a really difficult life one of my discoveries during the pandemic was that there simultaneously both too much sarkar and too little sarkar so sometimes yeah. you really want more of sarkar and it isn't there and sometimes you really want the sarkar to not be in your space uh, mm-hmm. and it's there there's a very yeah, funny those story are the questions those are the questions we want to deepen no where should sarkar be and where should sarkar not have to be uh where is it really the role of samaj to take back some of these things and work it out within the samaj right so uh um, that's the conversation the book is an, an invitation to deepen because i don't have all the answers nobody does yeah yeah but there's a funny story in the book about uh, somebody who tells nandan not to give a rash mm-hmm. driver his aadhar card so tell us that story i mean i was quite taken aback because the aadhar project was quite new and there was a lot of debate and discussion be people are for it people are against it people didn't understand it because it was early days and we were at the bangalore airport and we were just crossing and a car suddenly rushed at us and we literally had to jump back to avoid the car and we were like in shock for those few seconds when something like that happened and we heard a voice of one of those uh, airport taxi drivers who had looked at him and he said sir um, he said it actually yeah he said sir tum usko aadhar card bilkul mat dena and then i realized that it is got some public imagination and then later when i went around delhi and other places in nandan's term in delhi a lot of people i found for them it was a very very important thing intellectually i was saying what does it all mean but when i met the people for them it was something really important to them 
And that incident helped me to see how it has struck the public imagination. It was quite funny and moving also in some way. Yeah, it's a great leveler. I mean, for all the debates around the Aadhaar card and privacy and yeah. so on, it is the great leveler. And to that extent, it's an equal identity I, yeah, in the no, Republic. Yeah, I've to understand uh, over the years how India's amazing public digital infrastructure, which is one of the most sophisticated in the world, Balka, I'm beginning to think it can really lay the foundations for economic democracy. I refer to it, but very little in the book. Yeah. Finally, I have to ask you, you know, you shared this uh, figure about 43% individual giving went up in the pandemic. Uh, you and uh, Nandan gave up or took a pledge to, 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 to give half of your wealth to these causes that make you feel passionately. Do you think there's enough of this happening? What is your relationship with wealth over the years? Where does wealth figure in this intersection of markets, uh, Sarkar and Samaj? And I ask this because we are in, you know, our inequity in this country is rising. And the rich actually got richer during the pandemic. All the Oxfam reports tell you that. So I'm yeah. curious to know whether your relationship with wealth has changed over the years. You know, when I came into wealth, I was very uncomfortable because I was a bit of a mental sort of activist. And, uh, uh, you know, I told you simple living, high thinking, all those kinds of messages were drummed into us as children. And uh, when we when we ourselves became wealthy, I said, oops, I'm on the other side now. So <laughs> what does that mean, right? It took me years to settle down till I realized that this is an opportunity uh, to be grateful for. And how I use the wealth is going to be very important. And uh, so, of course, we are committed to give away a minimum of 50%. I hope we can do more. Um, but um, I think... Um, Wealth is distorting. It is distorting. Let's be very clear about that. So when we come back to, to come back to my book idea, I think a Samaj will only allow wealth creation and the bazaar has a great, wonderful role in wealth creation. But a Samaj can only allow wealth creation and such concentrated wealth creation for only so long. And it depends how that wealth is used by the wealthy. And the Sarkar's role is also to balance how much that wealth creation and how it is used. Taxation is a very powerful tool that the Sarkar has. Samaj has a very powerful way of expressing itself, right? Today in India, there are many um, polls which say Indians are optimistic. They are looking forward. Right now, they still feel very upwardly mobile. We know from around the world that when countries feel like that, citizens feel like that, they don't begrudge the wealthy from doing well because they feel maybe I can also become uh, Dhirubhai Ambani, right? But when they stop to feel like that, that's when really it matters what is the bazaar doing, what is the sarkar doing and how the wealthy are using their wealth. Because in the end of it, the wealth of the few has to be used for the prosperity of the many. You can't get away from that. You don't have to wear sackcloth and ashes. You can enjoy your wealth. But that wealth has a responsibility which simply cannot be avoided. So I think Samar, Sarkar and Bazaar have a role to regulate the operation of wealth in society. The Sarkar... But do you recognize that you, Nandan, maybe and some of you uh, others who I know personally as well, maybe people like Kiran, um, Premji, you're, you're still a rarity in this country, both in terms of pledging your wealth uh, for causes larger than yourselves, but even more rare because you're engaging with civic issues. A number of our billionaires just keep quiet. They just zip up. Does that frustrate you? Well, I've been involved for a long time now in encouraging Indian philanthropy and at least I have had extraordinarily positive responses. I can't speak for all the wealthy, but I can say for those who I have spoken to, they are more than open and the younger ones especially have already started giving in really interesting ways which my generation also doesn't understand how to do. So I am hopeful, but this doesn't happen. We can't only depend on the generosity of, of the wealthy, right? You need public policy, you need taxation, you need media attention, you need the discourse on the responsibility of wealth to be alive. And there's a lot of stuff happening now. The Hurun list comes out. People want to be on there. You know, there's a lot of spotlight now. So fingers crossed, I think uh, we saw that 
individuals and families can be incredibly generous. Okay, the wealthy have no choice uh, but to follow the dharma of the samaj. Is what I feel. Well, may there be many more like you. I found the book absolutely fascinating. It made me oh, think a lot about. Oh, thank you. I feel so good when you said that. No, really, the balance, you know, between um, um, you know, government. It's a it's yeah, a yeah. You know, what I've been writing. I just wanted to put it out because this phrase has caught on. Samaj Sarkar Bazaar, and I thought I should explain a little more what I mean by that, and that yeah. uh, that the conversation needs to deepen in your fa- in your homes, in your offices, and with your political representatives. That Absolutely. Was the and that's why, by the way, we put out the book in the Creative Commons. So that's yeah. also available free. So we're trying a new model so that students, you know, people can also get it and start their own discussions. That's an important point. Uh, we will actually have a link in the description below. If you want to download this book, you will be able to click that link and download it for free. Uh, this is a self-published book. It's part of Rohini's larger uh philosophy of democratizing access to information and ideas, which is a large part of deepening democracy. And democracy isn't just what happens in elections, but what happens in between elections. Thank you, Rohini. It's a pleasure as always. Thank you. Thank you. It's great to see you here. Thank you for watching our work. If you haven't subscribed yet, don't forget to click the bell icon and subscribe to Mojo's Story and support independent, robust journalism.